Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Mexborough and Swinton weekly webinar. This evening, I'll take the, have the pleasure in introducing Mike Frost, who, as I uh, already told you, lives in rugby. And uh, for his day job, he's a systems engineer working in the steel industry. And if I'm remembering correctly, that does not just um, rest in these shores where we are now, but anywhere in the world. I think um, South America was the last time that I heard you were, or where you'd said you were abroad. So I hope um, that's still happening while I'm keeping you in uh, gainful employment. So in his spare time, he's an astronomer. He chases eclipses and he's visited astronomical sites worldwide. On our website, if you have a look to, um, after tonight's meeting, you can see him standing in the He's swanging, is that right? Swaying. Pardon? Swaying is uh, it roughly how it's pronounced. Right, thank you very much. Uh, Meteor Crater, which is 40 kilometres north of Pretoria in South Africa. He's a member of the Coventry and Warwickshire Astronomical Society, the Society for the History of Astronomy, the British Astronomical Association, and the Royal Astronomical Society. So plenty to keep him busy, even if he's not working. Um, there's a few things in common with Jeremiah Horrocks in that obviously they're both astronomers. They both grew up in Lancashire. Somebody has to, as we yeah. keep telling our present Alan Chapman. <laughs> um, they both have had relatives in Rhode Island in America. They both attended Emmanuel College in Cambridge, as did a surprising number of other historical characters, some of whom some of whom knew Jeremiah. And this lecture is a guided tour through Jeremiah Horrocks brief, extraordinary life. So if you can please welcome this evening, our guest speaker, Mike Frost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, lo lovely to talk to you all. Isn't it a pity that we can't uh, we can't meet in person these days? That uh, um, it, uh, I, I came to talk to you about five years or so ago, and that is it is a long way up the motorway. So I'm I'm spared the journey up, and even better, I'm spared the journey back. Uh, but it's uh, I'd, I'd much prefer if I could come and talk to you in person. So let me see if I can do the share, and if I can do the share, then I can uh, do start doing the presentation. So that's that, and if I do a share on that. You should now see my presentation, and if I do from beginning, um, we start off with, yep, yeah, you can see that? Lovely. Yes, thank you. Yep, yeah, okay. Mike, that's great. Okay, uh, so I will start with a, a, a little plug uh, for my, I run the historical section of the British Astronomical Association, and we have our annual meeting uh, this weekend, uh, this Saturday. Uh, <clears throat> was supposed to be at the Birmingham Midland Institute in uh, in Birmingham, uh, which is a great place to hold meetings, not least because it is the it holds the library of the Society for the History of Astronomy, which I'm also a member of. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, meetings in the real world are not happening at the moment. Uh, so instead of having a day long meeting in the, in uh, in Birmingham, we we're, we're, we took one of our speakers and asked him to 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 give a webinar instead of a, a web presentation. It's Dr. Jeffrey Belknap from the uh, National Science and Media Museum in Bradford, um, uh, uh, who uh, he's his specialist, world-class specialist on the history of photography. So he's going to be telling us about the early history of astrophotography. So the meeting is open to everybody. Uh, BAA has decided in these current uh, circumstances that uh, uh, it's good for, for it's good for the community if uh, everybody gets the chance to see them. If you go to the uh, Brit Astro, the uh, the BAA web page, and then go to events, you should find yourself. To this page here uh, with Zoom uh, meeting, uh, Zoom joining instructions, or alternatively, uh, you can watch it on the BAA YouTube channel either live as it happens or uh, uh, later on when it, uh, 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 it it will go up afterwards. So uh, there's something for you to do Saturday afternoon if you're if you're not uh, if you're not been dragged out to the, the the Christmas shopping. If we're still allowed to do Christmas shopping, uh, I am uh, to answer uh, Steve's um, uh, 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 um, uh, question. Yes, I am still in gainful employment. Uh, I still actually go into work. My uh, my uh, employer considers me to be a uh, a key worker. Uh, it's pushing it a bit, but National Grid are amongst our customers, so uh, we really do need to be able to 
log through to their uh, their sites uh, to to check things. Uh, I do travel an awful amount to, to around the world to see uh, Steelworks. Uh, I, most of this year, and in fact most of last year as well, I was supposed to be doing a Steelworks in, in uh, on the shores of Lake Michigan uh, in the uh, Greater Chicago Land, uh, and who knows when that will happen. Uh, latest estimates are middle of next year, but I don't know. Uh, and as Steve said, the uh, um, the, uh, uh, the previous job that I did before that, a major job, was in Argentina. And uh, I still do, still am in contact with the Argentinians and uh, I log through to their website from time to time. Uh, I'm, uh, you might, know, might, rec might know that the, the next eclipse of the sun, December the 14th, uh, crosses uh, Southern America, um, Argentina and, and Argentinian Patagonia and Chilean Patagonia. And I am still on to be a guest astronomer for Astro Trails tour to, uh, to Patagonia. Who knows whether or not that will happen. A lot of things can go wrong between now and December. Uh, but if it does happen, then uh, I'm not actually sure yet whether or not I'll be in Chile or in Argentina. If I go to Argentina, I'm not sure whether or not I tell my uh, my uh, my customers in the, in the steelworks in San Nicolas, because they might try and kidnap me, uh, hold me hostage and, uh, and lock me in the computer room to, to fix all their many problems. But uh, I, I, on the other hand, I might actually need their help if I find myself uh, stranded if the airlines fail and I find myself stranded in Argentina. Worst place is to be. I mean, Argentina is a very nice country and uh, excellent steak and fantastic Malbec wine and uh, lots of football on the television. So, you know, I could, I could, I could survive there, I'm sure. But uh, this is this may all be very interesting, but uh, it's not what I've been uh, asked to talk about. Uh, so our talk tonight uh, is Jeremiah Horrocks, a very curious astronomer. And I will start with a picture from uh, one of the great days of my life and possibly of your lives too. I hope I hope you all saw it. Uh, June the 8th, 2004. Uh, I, I see some nods from the audience. Uh, wasn't it a wonderful moment when we saw that black dot appearing on the sun? And I hope you all did. With the weather, well, the weather in the south of England was, was pretty nice. I hope it extended uh, further northwards. We had, a, for once, the weather was on our side. Uh, it totally eclipses get it get clouded out and um, uh, you know but uh, uh, 2004 I had no complaints whatever for I watched the start of the transit from my back garden here in rugby and then I drove over to Cambridge uh, where we uh, for, for, for uh, well, be, what become clear reasons we were celebrating Jeremiah Horrocks uh, at, uh, at, uh, at Emmanuel College so uh, at, in fact at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge as well but uh, it's uh, uh, such a something so straightforward and plain shouldn't be quite so evocative but it is that beautiful black dot on the more or less clear uh, disk of the sun uh, and what made it so especially it, it is the transit of planet venus across the face of the sun just in case anybody's not quite sure what it was uh, but the amazing thing about it what makes it so special was that morning when we woke up that dawn that day, nobody alive had ever seen a transit of Venus. There hadn't been one for over 120 years. The entire 20th century had no transits of Venus. There were people who lived to a century, the Queen Mother, Bob Hope and so on, who never had chance to see a transit of Venus. How privileged we were that morning to see it and have the good weather to see it and to understand what was going on extraordinary and it captured the public imagination as well i think that people were intrigued to know what this was and certainly the institute of astronomy in cambridge was absolutely packed with people and uh, martin reese the astronomer royal was wandering around looking very pleased with himself as, as so he should be public outreach par excellence very good uh, in the present epoch uh, transits occur in pairs eight years apart so as far as we know there are really only seven uh, 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 um, seven that we've actually uh, that we actually know for certain have been observed uh, June the 8th 2004 the one I've just shown the picture of and then it's uh, its cousin uh, June the 5th to the 6th 2012 it's not like nobody knew it, it crossed the international date line so uh, some people saw it on the 5th some saw it on the 6th uh, I don't know how many people saw that one uh, the weather was not quite so cooperative. It was just after dawn. Uh, I was with some friends from, uh, for actually from the Rugby Astronomical Society, which I also attend quite often. Uh, we, we camped out in a campsite near Banbury, and in the morning uh, at dawn, we went and stood in a field and watched the cloud for a long, for a couple of a couple of hours, as we knew that the transit was be well. First of all, Venus began to leave the sun uh, and get further and further away, and then as if by a magic a miracle, a miracle occurred, a most agreeable spectacle. The, the, uh, uh, there was a small hole in the crowd and for about 
two minutes or so, we could see the sun, we could project it, and we could see Venus, not quite on the sun, but more like clinging on by its fingertips, but we saw it. This makes me the joint world record holder for a number of transits of Venus seen. I've seen two of them, well, one and a half, but that's not. Uh, uh, so uh, it, 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 again, was very special. Not quite as special as 2004, but I did actually see it. Brighter, none in the 20th century, two in the, in the, in the 19th century, uh, December 1874, December 1882. Uh, before that, 105 years before that, in 1761, 1769, uh, there were June, two June transits. And then before that were the ones we'll be talking about December 1631 and December the 4th 1639 and the calendar had uh, uh, hadn't changed at that point so they thought it was mistakenly thought that it was no the November the 24th in the old style calendar that's how they reckoned the day and you can see that they occur in pairs uh, one lot in June and then one lot in December and then another lot in June and another lot in December and that goes onwards sometimes you only get one occasionally but essentially that uh, that that sort of structure persists for thousands of years and I'll explain a little bit as to why that happened. At 17th of December 7, 1631, as we'll see, uh, we don't know of it for, for certain of anybody who actually saw it. So the first one that we know for certain that somebody saw was the December the 4th, 1639, November 24th, old style. And the first time observed by 1639 was observed by Jeremiah Horrocks, the subject of this talk. I should deal with a possibility it may have been seen by other astronomers in other cultures. Uh, for example, in the British Museum, apparently, I've, I've not seen it, and there's an Assyrian tablet, which if one translates generously, says something along the lines of the planet Venus, dot, 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 it passed across, dot, 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 the sun, dot, 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 the face of the sun. Uh, and uh, Mr. Johnson in Historical Future Eclipses pointed this out. I don't know what all the dot, dot, dots mean. Uh, they may have seen it, I hope they did, uh, but I don't regard that as, uh, as absolutely proven. But wouldn't it be nice to think that uh, uh, to, to, two millennia before Jeremiah Horrocks people did manage to see a transit of Venus? Not convinced. I'm a little bit more convinced by arguments that possibly the, the Mayans in, in, in Central America, in Mexico, might have seen a, a, a transit of Venus uh, because Venus was such a central part of their cosmology. Their priest classes did a lot of observing of, of Venus and certainly were in a position to know that Venus was going to be close to the sun at particular times. I'm not convinced I mean, they knew a lot about astronomy. Their level of astronomical knowledge was was not too far off the same level of Europe or China or India in in, in the 1600s and the 1500s. So that they may have had some inkling that something was going on, but I'm not completely convinced. One of our historical section meetings up in Stirling two or three years ago, we had a, a young woman called Dr. Vanessa Smear Barreto, who had just graduated, just got her doctorate from Edinburgh University. She was she's from Mexico, and she gave very good talk to us on the on on Mexican astronomy uh, and it's her contention and uh, it, she presented some evidence that the uh, uh, that the Mayans actually did see um, uh, the transit one of the transits of Venus. Um, uh, it, it, it's possible I mean she's, uh, she's better qualified than I am so uh, I, who, um, who am I to argue with her but uh, uh, there are other arguments that are not quite so strong for example the, from the Norton history of cosmology and astronomy there used to be a picture near a sacred underworld lake at Chichen Itza I hope some of you've been to Chichen Itza I've, I've been there I'm amazing Mayan city in the Yucatan Peninsula. This showed a square sun, not a good start, rising over the horizon and it, shared, it carried a date equivalent to 15th of December 1145. Modern cal calculations show a rare transit of Venus was indeed seen on that day. Well, square sun is not great. Maybe they were flat earthers or something like that. But the square sun rising above the horizon, uh, modern transit, that would all be very well. And it'd be even more impressive if there was actually a transit from Venus on that day. Uh, but it wasn't for another eight years that that particular transit of Venus happened. So this is the kind of thing I'm worried about is one's back peddling one's own calculations and putting them on top of uh, what the what the Mayans had there and, and putting it in modern day interpretations on things that we don't really understand. I mean, it is possible uh, they might have been able to project Venus. They had uh, chambers in which you could project a, a small pinhole a large way. So you could, it'd certainly be possible for them to see a transit of Venus if they knew one was happening. So it's possible Montezuma, for example, Montezuma and his priests saw the transit of 1518, which was visible at sunset in, in the Yucatan. Now, of course, all it takes is one cloud to be in the way, uh, and that would that would really spoil their day, even if they knew it was going to happen. So, not convinced, but it's certainly possible to see a transit of Venus. 
you need to be able to observe the sun, duh, uh, uh, and that means you've got to, uh, uh, it, but you've got to be able to observe the sun safely. I mean, if you look at the sun, you blind yourself, you know, with any sort of magnification, and you'll dazzle yourself if you do it just with the, with the, uh, the Mark One eyeball. So you need something to uh, make the the sun it's not so overwhelmingly bright. Uh, you can look at it through clouds. Uh, I mean, I've, some, I've seen sunspots through clouds, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have, uh, or through mist or whatever. I don't recommend ever using any sort of magnification for that sort of thing but with clouds you can sometimes see things on the sun of course if you get sunset as well then uh, um, then the, uh, the the all the atmosphere the sunlight has to go through attenuates it so you see a red sun setting and again if there was the transit of venus happening at that time you might be able to spot it or a pinhole as i say uh, 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 dr dr smell uh, 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 sent me papers on the, uh, the possibility that there were chambers in, in which you could uh, project the, uh, the project the sun without needing a lens or anything like that uh, you need to be able to recognize that it's Venus and not a sunspot. I mean, it's uh, pretty obvious that it's nice and round when you look at it with a magnified picture. Not so obvious when you're, uh, uh, when you're looking at it with, uh, with the naked eye. And it certainly helps if you know the transit is taking place. And for that reason, really, you need to be able to predict a transit of Venus. And I'm not entirely convinced that the mind cosmology was good enough to predict transit of Venus as opposed to near, near, near misses. Because you need an understanding motion, uh, understanding of the motions of the planets well a lot of cultures had that but uh, you, for the accuracy to be able to predict something like a transit of venus you need comprehensive accurate measurements and certainly in western europe uh, we're in come 1639 we had the people who, who, who over the previous century who had provided people uh, jeremiah horrocks with that base of accurate observations nicolas copernicus who reinstated uh, the uh, the sun at the center of the solar system ancient greek astronomers had suggested it aristarchus of samos uh, nicolas copernicus uh, not only uh, resuggested it but uh, put forward a, a quite convincing proof that it was happening Tycho Brahe, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the great Danish astronomer, uh, the greatest astronomer of the pre-telescopic -tel pre era, who uh, acquired the uh, 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 very accurate for, for naked eye astronomy observations of the motions of the planets. Galileo Galilei, who used the telescope for astronomical purposes, and Blackadder lookalike Johannes Kepler, who, uh, who uh, uh, figured out the laws of planetary motion. Uh, and I, I think I told you about these last time I talked to you, so I won't, uh, I won't labor them. Uh, Kepler was the first person to figure out that the orbits of the planet around the sun were an ellipse with the sun at one focus. Not a, not a circle, not a circle with, uh, with, uh, 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 with other circles rotating around them, but elliptical, a squash circle with a particular with the sun at a particular point in that geometric construction uh, and the the line joining the sun to a planet sweeps at equal areas and equal times so when it's closest to the sun it moves fastest uh, that's rather more elliptical than any planet in the solar system but is the kind of orbit you'd see with a, something like a comet it goes very fast when it's close to the sun it's rather slow when it's further away and then finally uh, the uh, Kepler's third law he didn't put he didn't put, say it was his third law but it was in in one of his books is to say that the uh, the orbit with a, a, a relating how fast each of the planets moves relative to each other. Uh, they didn't know the size of the solar system, but they realized that uh, if you took whatever it was, if you scaled it, and uh, if you took the square of the orbital period and then the the, uh, the cube, divided by the cube of the semi-axis, that's the, the longest line across the ellipse, uh, that was a constant. And uh, essentially that means that uh, uh, Mercury whizzes around the sun very quickly, Venus uh, quite quickly, Earth uh, quickly, Mars uh, rather slower and so on and so forth until you get out to, to Eurus, Neptune, Pluto that are going very slowly indeed. Venus goes around the sun in 224.7 days. That's not just because it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's closer, it's got less distance to go, it's because it's moving faster as well. Earth goes around the sun 365 days uh, and so uh, it's it, uh, it, it, it almost pointing out the obvious that uh, from Kepler's third law, it's actually the other way around. Kepler had figured out from, uh, for, from figuring out how, uh, how, how far away from the sun Venus got that uh, Venus must be about 70% of the way from the, the sun to the Earth, and therefore uh, uh, every 1.6 years, uh, Venus laps Earth on the inside. So Venus takes off at speed, circles around, and Earth is making a more stately progression around. And every 1.6 years, every eight fifths, uh, eight, eight, one and three fifths of a year, uh, Venus catches up with the Earth. And we call this a conjunction, of course. So the question is, why don't we get a transit of Venus every 1.6 years, every conjunction? And the reason for that is, 
that the, the orbits of the Venus and the Earth are tilted, and not by very much. We, we, all the planets orbit in essentially the same plane, dictated by Jupiter, I think, the ecliptic. Uh, uh, but you are allowed a little bit of variation away from, from flat, and the, the orbits of the Venus and the Earth are tilted at an angle of 3.4 degrees. Uh, and so there are only certain times when you can have a transit that uh, uh, Venus crosses the plane of the Earth's orbit around the Sun in June and in December, and that's why you can only have transits in June and in December, unless you change your calendar to make December, November. But, um, you know, it's, uh, they, 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 it, uh, they, uh, Venus doesn't care about our calendar. It, it crosses the uh, the Earth's orbit at, at, at these particular times, and if the Earth happens to be in the right position, then it will see a transit of Venus. But most of the time, it's elsewhere in its orbit when Venus crosses the Earth's uh, the, the plane of the Earth's orbit. I hope that's clear. So, uh, Johannes Kepler, uh, having done all these, uh, having uh, used Tycho's observations uh, and figured out the motions of planets around the, the Sun, uh, was in a position to be able to predict transits. Possibly, uh, well, certainly the first Westerner to be able to do so, and I suspect the first person absolutely anywhere. Uh, and he, um, he, he produced a set of tables, the Rudolphine tables for uh, King, uh, King Rudolf of Czechoslovakia. Uh, no idea whether or not he had a red nose. But anyway, 1627, uh, Kepler produced these tables and he made predictions. He, he, uh, he calculated ahead and he figured out that there were, in the very near future, going to be two transits. There was going to be a transit of Mercury on November the 6th, 1631, and a transit of Venus on December the 7th, 1631. And the, so this was very, I mean, it's, uh, just a good, uh, we get quite a few transits of Mercury, they happen every few years. We had one, uh, was it this year? I can't remember, but uh, uh, last year, wasn't there? There was one that, uh, uh, and uh, November last year, about a year ago. Uh, and uh, and uh, so this, they, they, they happen quite frequently, but there was one coming up in the next few years. And a very rare transit of Venus, Kepler knew enough to know that they were quite rare, uh, just, uh, just a month afterwards. And the uh, the transit of Venus in uh, uh, transit of Mercury in November 1631 was successfully observed by the French astronomer Pierre Gassendi. But as far as we know, nobody managed to observe the transit of Venus. Gassendi tried, but uh, I don't think that it was actually visible from Paris. There were bits of Europe. I think if he'd been the west of Spain, he might have been able to see it. I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure about that, but I'm not sure that uh, the great observatories, or the, uh, the great cities in Europe where there were astronomers actually were able to see it. And I once wrote an article to the effect that uh, uh, that uh, 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 that uh, Gassendi successfully seen the transit of Mercury in 1631, but although he tried to see it in December, so it, nothing was able to be seen to the frustration of both Pierre Gassendi and Johannes Kepler. And when I write articles, uh, quite often I send them off to uh, to my fellow astronomers to just to sort of check them for sense and clarity. And I sent this one, I think it's to Lee MacDonald, who used to be my deputy of the, the historical section. And Lee came back with a very pithy comment. He said, in December 1631, uh, Kepler was not frustrated. He was dead. Uh, so careful what you write with these things. I, I was going to email back saying, well, how do you know he wasn't frustrated? But uh, I, I take the point. You should, uh, you should check your facts. Uh, okay, uh, Johannes Kepler had already he died November 1660 30. Um, how frustrating uh, to die uh, before you, you before these uh, you know within a year of these uh, of the first of these events or almost within a year of the second one and not to know whether or not your predictions were were uh, uh, were accurate how, how how very frustrating for him at least in November 1630 and, and maybe frustrating for him in November 1631 and December 1631 I don't know Pierre Gassendi on the other hand didn't hold back this is his description of seeing the, the transit of Mercury. I have been more fortunate than those hunters after Mercury who sought the cunning god in the sun. I found him out and saw him where no one else had hitherto seen him. Uh, they don't write scientific papers like that anymore. Apparently he observed from his house in Paris. He was on the top floor and there was an assistant on the floor below him writing down observations. And, and Mercury appears on the sun and Gassendi hammers on the floor to let him know that the transit was happening and he'd gone home for lunch. Uh, I, can, I can imagine that the, uh, what happened. 
I mean, imagine seeing this thing for the first time. Nobody else had ever seen one of these things. Uh, and the only person who, 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 who can back you up has disappeared. I, I'm sure when he came back from his lunch, there was quite an interesting conversation. Fortunately, it goes on for several hours. This is a picture from, uh, I think, the 2003 transit. There's a couple of things to note on there, actually. It's not like Mercury disappeared halfway across. Uh, all that happened, there were clouds crossing the sun during, as the time lapse was going on. So there's sometimes when the, you weren't able to take a picture. Uh, and you note as well, these sort of extended sunspots, they're not actually extended sunspots. What's happening, of course, is the sun is actually rotating. So a sunspot, if you take a time lapse photography, will actually wrap its way a little bit around the, the sun as, as you're taking this picture. So it's, a, it's not it, it more, a little more detail than you might think. But you see how small Mercury was, which was a complete surprise to Gassendi. He was expecting something really rather bigger. And he must have doubted uh, when he saw the tiny dot, can that really be Mercury? Uh, and, and, must, and it must have been a relief that it, 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 it began to make its way forward and clearly was moving rather faster than the sunspots that, uh, uh, that were all, almost stationary by comparison. So uh, uh, Jeremiah Hawkes was not the first person to see a transit of any sort that, as far as we know, but certainly in the West, was, uh, was Pierre Gassendi. So this takes us to Jeremiah Horrocks at last, finally got onto the subject of my talk. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and as with many people from, you know, several hundred years ago, uh, the, the, the detail, uh, we are... <laughs> I guess we have to, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the detail in some of his life is missing and we don't know too much about his early life. A chap called Sidney Gaythorpe is a member of the BAA about a century or so ago who did spectacular amounts of research on Jeremiah Horrocks in an age, of course, he didn't, uh, he didn't have email or, or Wikipedia or, or Google or anything like that, but essentially he wrote off to lots and lots of universities asking for information and he was a quite, he got quite a comprehensive amount of information, including uh, best guesses as to Jeremiah Horrocks' early life. We think he was born in Toxteth, suburb of Liverpool, of course, in 1618, excuse me, or possibly 1619. Uh, 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 baptismal records and so on, we're not absolutely certain about. Uh, or possibly in Bolton, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a possibility. There was a, certainly a Bolton branch of the Horrocks family and Dean, just I think is west of Bolton, uh, there, there were Horrocks there. Uh, his mother, uh, we're fairly sure, was Mary Aspinwall of Toxteth and his father, James Horrocks of Toxteth, a watchmaker or possibly William Horrocks, a farmer from Bolton. Uh, it's not like she didn't know which of the two of them. It, 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 we're just not certain what the, what the familial relationships there, whether or not she's married to James Horrocks in Toxteth, which seems the most likely possibility, or whether or not she's married to William Horrocks in Bolton. But I, I think the evidence is pretty, pretty, pretty good that she was in Toxteth, married to James Horrocks, the watchmaker. Uh, and probably under those circumstances, she was uh, he was educated by Richard Mather, uh, the uh, 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 well-known school teacher of the time in the Toxteth area that would make a lot of sense that uh, you know Horrocks went on to do the very big good thing so uh, Mather was a well-known uh, school teacher but we're not absolutely certain in fact the first location that we can place him for absolute certainty was as Steve said in the introduction Emmanuel College in Cambridge uh, and I'll tell you how you can see exactly why we know he was there uh, in a moment or so but just to say a few words uh, just, Emmanuel was founded in 1584 by Walter Mildmay, uh, and it was founded uh, as a um, Puritan college. Uh, it was in, in as a reaction to the uh, uh, to the the, uh, the excesses, as was seen by many, of Anglicanism, and so it's quite an austere college in some respects. Uh, I mean, it looks quite spectacular. This is the chapel and the gallery, but if you go inside the chapel, it's got none of the ornate finery of uh, the Trinity College or, of course, of the Great King's College very 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 beautiful places uh, Emmanuel College has a beauty to it but it's a rather more austere beauty I, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm playing it down for a it's, it's, it's a lovely place and if you go through the gallery to the right you end up in the gardens of Emmanuel which I think uh, uh, many people will regard as, as Cambridge's loveliest gardens and I who am I to say? Uh, I matric uh, Jeremiah Horrocks matriculated there in 1639. I matriculated there 349 years and six months later. 
so we never met. Uh, in, be in between Jeremiah and myself, uh, well, we, Emmanuel's done pretty well for astronomers. Um, uh, Thomas Young, the guy who came up with the wave theory of light, was a fellow of Emmanuel. Um, Fred Hoyle was a, an undergraduate at Emmanuel. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not saying this as a sort of arithmetic progression, Horrocks Young uh, and me, uh, because it doesn't. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 in recent years, James Pringle, the uh, cosmologist, Carolyn Crawford, who I'm sure many of you will have come across, uh, she's current director of studies in, uh, in the sciences uh, at, at Emmanuel College and Andrew Ponson, who's an up-and-coming uh, star of uh, computational cosmology, uh, all, all studied Emmanuel, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with them all. Carolyn actually uh, gave a, a talk in the Institute of Astronomy to the general public on transit day. Um, uh, it's quite impressive uh, lecturing to a whole series of people, most of whom seem to be on their mobile phones while she was giving her talk, but she, she gamely managed, and uh, she, she's a really excellent lecturer, so uh, uh, she, she got the attention of the people who actually mattered. So, uh, 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 so the, the the reason we know that uh, Jeremiah Horrocks was uh, in Emmanuel in 1639 was that he signed the Emmanuel Co College uh, Admissions Register, and you can see uh, I, I've added the, uh, the, the dotted lines there. Jeremy Horrocks, Lancastro, May 18th, uh, and I signed this very same register, not the same volume, but uh, you know about 30 or so volumes on uh, in uh, when, when I went there in uh, in uh, September, uh, October 1981. Um, I've got my 349 years and six months. Uh, we know. Uh, uh, Ralph Cudworth was uh, was quite uh, who's two above him uh, was quite famous theologian um, and uh, I, there's a similar one for the university and there his uh, his uh, his friend Jer Jen John Worthington signed uh, next to him so uh, it, we know some of his friends for, for well, while he was there so uh, you'll notice that some of the people decided it say two shillings and six months and some of them say ten shillings so let me explain a little bit about the register uh, a, a Jeremy Horrocks in series, and you'll notice he's he's uh, he's uh, as many people do has, uh, has shortened uh, Jeremiah to Jeremy. Uh, he's also uh, 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 also Horrocks CKS has become uh, an X. Uh, what you do is put down your county of origin. So uh, I'm from the uh, I'm, I'm from the great county of Lancaster, uh, as is Jeremy Horrocks, and uh, and the, he puts Lancaster there to to indicate that May the 18th was the day that he matriculated, and two shillings and sixpence was what he paid. Uh, and there's a uh, there's a register of college admissions up to 1772, so it's quite useful for for finding uh, people who you suspect may have been at the college. 1632, May the 18th, says Mr. Bennett, Horrocks Jeremiah uh, uh, S, the size which will come to a minute, like County of Lancaster at Toxteth, so that confirms that that's probably where he was from, was a very curious astro. This lead, leads the uh, title to my talk. Uh, we're a, a very curious astronomer. Uh, and by curious, it means um, uh, inquisitive, I think, rather than peculiar, although it might have been both. Uh, uh, but um, and the, the words change slightly over the centuries. Uh, but, what, but this S for Sizar means that he um, uh, it means that he was on reduced fees for which he had to for, uh, in return for which he had to perform menial tasks. Uh, for example, waiting on the tables of the of the wealthier students, or indeed clearing out the chamber pots. Um, you know these sorts of things. Uh, Isaac Newton, who was at Trinity College about uh, forty or so years after Jeremiah Horrocks, uh, no, about thirty or so years, uh, was also a Sizar, and uh, and uh, I think like Horrocks didn't like being a Sizar. Uh, Horrocks wasn't a particularly happy student there. Um, he, uh, he, he, he sounded fairly miserable in, in some of the things he wrote about it, but uh, uh, but he made friends and and uh, and it, um, uh, it it stood him in good stead. Uh, there were quite a few famous people uh, around at that time ish uh, from the 17th century. It was one of the golden eras in the in the in the history of Emmanuel. For example, this chap here. Another young student. My father had a fault, small estate in Nottinghamshire. I was the third of five sons. He sent me to Emmanuel College, only one M, but never mind, in Cambridge at 14 years old, where I resided three years and applied myself close to my studies. Well, didn't we all? Uh, 14 is not particularly young uh, for a student in those days. Essentially, what they were doing was closer to sort of A levels, so they, they attended earlier, younger, 14 to 18 years old. Some, some people would come slightly later on, but 14 years old on was, was, was not by any means. Now, have you any idea who wrote those words? Uh, you may know, actually. Uh, I, 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 get to, I haven't got to get too much back from my audience, so I'll just have to tell you. It actually, you may have already read it because it's from the opening paragraphs of Gulliver's Travels. Uh, 
Lemuel Gulliver, I, I, I mean, he, he, he starts off with an assertion that this is a true thing. So everything that happened in this book is, uh, actually did happen to me. It's all true. Uh, I, it's obviously Donald Trump's been taking lessons from him, but uh, he, uh, he, he then goes on to give a little potted history of himself. And what he's trying to do, I think, uh, what uh, Jonathan Swift is trying to do, obviously it's fictional. Lemuel Gulliver was not actually a manual. Uh, but uh, Jonathan Swift, what he's trying to do is establish that Jeremiah Horrocks is an edgy, uh, Jeremiah, that, that uh, Lemuel Gulliver is an educated chap and to be, uh, it can be respected. And so when he tells you about all these extraordinary places he's been around the world, Lilliput and uh, Brobdingnag and all the rest of the places, he's actually telling uh, God's own truth and, uh, uh, and please, please believe him. So uh, anyway, uh, Gull Lemuel Gulliver, if you, it, it, there are lots of dates. It's, it's, it's written as a sort of uh, mock historical uh, account of his life. And if you add all the dates together, I think Gulliver was closer to the time that Isaac Newton was at Cambridge rather than the time that uh, that Jeremiah Horrocks was at Cambridge, but uh, uh, you know, so I, I rather hope that if Lemuel Gulliver had been there, he'd have plagued uh, Isaac Newton. But uh, he couldn't quite have met uh, uh, Jeremiah Horrocks, even though they were both at the same college. Two more Emmanuel men. Uh, it's rather more likely that it, it's certainly possible. I'm not certain that uh, that uh, Jeremiah Horrocks might have met uh, John Harvard, uh, born in Stratford-on-Avon, just down the road from from where I live in in Warwickshire. Uh, matriculated in 1627, which is the year or two before, and graduated the same year that Jeremiah Horrocks arrived. So not by absolute certainty. He came back. Uh, this quite common uh, was to uh, to come back uh, a few years later once you'd earned some money uh, to get a master's degree, an MA, uh, for which, uh, as far as I can see, the main qualification is that you. Pay them, pay them some extra money, uh, and then almost immediately uh, crossed the Atlantic uh, and uh, uh, and was part of the the colonies in New England, which I'll speak about a little bit more. Uh, and he was a very wealthy man. He was a, a merchant, uh, and he wanted to make a name for himself. So he gave money for the foundation of a university. Harvard University, of course, is now the uh, uh, possibly the most preeminent, uh, one of the most preeminent universities in the world. It's neck and neck with Cambridge for the uh, for the number of uh, for the most Nobel prizes run by any university. So we say, Emmanuel, well, we've got both of them. We've got to, we're, we're part of Cambridge University that may have the most, most Nobel Prizes. But if you think it's Harvard, well, John Harvard went there as well. Uh, this is his uh, statue in the, in the main square in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, 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 and as I say, he never actually saw his own university because he died before he, he could actually do it. But he, he, he was the benefactor of it. Uh, another chap of, of some interest, perhaps, it's like a little bit before Jeremiah Horrocks' time, but is a chap called William Blackstone. Uh, so he took his MA about uh, 10 years or so before uh, Jeremiah Horrocks and, and he like well because it was a Puritan college at the time uh, and there was a lot of persecution, a lot of uh, Emmanuel graduates sailed across the Atlantic. So uh, it's something like uh, 29 out of the first 100 um, uh, 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 graduates do in the American colonies were from Emmanuel. We were very strong in the foundation of it. And he was the first settler in the state of Rhode Island uh, to, to the west of Massachusetts uh, and the, these settlers here Jeremiah Horrocks we know one of my other talks is about uh, Jeremiah Horrocks's con uh, uh, connections to the, the state of, of Rhode Island. Now we don't have an accurate portrait. I'm, I'm, fairly, I'm not sure whether or not this is, is an accurate likeness of William Blackstone but see what you think. Uh, there's a story uh, behind this. If I get time afterwards, ask me, and I'll tell you how it how it comes to be that uh, William Blackstone is, is is depicted as a Mr. Potato Head ca character. It's quite an interesting story, but there's very little to do with transit of Venus. So he has connections to the New World with absolute certainty. He corresponded with people there, uh, and he may have known some of the, the major figures. Uh, but uh, back in Cambridge itself, as I say, he he, 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 he I don't think he's particularly social creature. Uh, but on the other hand, he did get down he would applied himself closely to his studies like Lemuel Gulliver did uh, and the study would consist of Latin Greek Hebrew literature and divinity uh, and if you did that it's the the quadrivium is the uh, is the important stuff geometry astronomy logic and music uh, and then if you did the the the, uh, the, the other pursuits which is uh, uh, oh, grammar um, uh, uh, rhetoric and I can't remember the other one uh, they were le considered lesser or the trivium or trivial pursuits so we say so uh, uh, he, he'd certainly uh, as part of his, his uh, curriculum, he would some st study some classical astronomy. 
but he knew uh, better than most uh, that there was astronomy going on in Europe. So he began private study uh, with a copy of the astronomical tables of the Belgian astronomer, Philip Landsberg. Uh, so uh, Jeremiah Horrocks knew about Galileo and he knew about Kepler and Tycho and all the rest of it. And he wanted to know more about him. He wasn't very impressed with Landsberg, who at one point he calls a pompous Belgian, uh, but uh, it, it, they were, he knew that they were at least as good as the sort of classical uh, uh, predictions of the, the Greek astronomers. Uh, and more importantly, perhaps he built up a network of friends. John Wallace was an Emmanuel, we certainly knew John Wallace, an amazing person, well worth finding out a little bit more about. The Alan Turing of his time, cryptographer, he cracked codes for the parliamentarians during the Civil War, and a geometer, quite a significant figure in the, in the, the mathematics uh, that, uh, that Isaac Newton took on to become the calculus, infinite series and so on. John Wallace knew a lot about. John Worthington uh, became a, a don, a, 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 an academic in Cambridge and then in, in Manchester area, uh, and he he probably introduced uh, Jeremiah Horrocks to William Crabtree, a draper, cloth merchant in Salford, Broughton in, in Western Manchester, uh, and also a very keen astronomer. We'll see William Crabtree a little bit later on. And William Crabtree uh, uh, introduced, uh, again, probably by letters and so on, there was a perfectly serviceable postal service, to William Gascoigne, the instrument maker, the inventor of the micrometer in Leeds, in the, in, over, in the, over on the Yorkshire side of the Pennines. So it was, uh, and again, I'll say a little bit more about this, there was a uh, a, uh, a, a great uh, tradition of North Country astronomy, uh, which all these people, well, not, not John Wallace was, but uh, Horrocks and Crabtree and William Gascoigne were great North Country astronomers. I, I think that Alan Chapman has a paper entitled pretty much that. Uh, so he, uh, he, he, after leaving Cambridge, uh, the intention was probably going to be that he'd return to get his MA, although he, as we'll see, he never did. Uh, but he returned to he, he returned to Toxteth to the to the family home, presumably, uh, and started making observations. He didn't just leave his, his studies behind. Uh, uh, for example, uh, our fellow countryman Horrocks was the first to propose that the moon revolves around the Earth in an ellipse. Uh, not a bad thing to put on your book cover, uh, but that was actually by uh, Isaac Newton. Uh, in, as mentioned in the Principia Mathematica. Praise from Newton uh, was, was praise indeed. He didn't pray, tend to praise very many people. Uh, it probably helps that Horrocks was dead by this time. I think Newton was uh, uh, was happy to praise people who uh, didn't, didn't pose any sort of threat to him. But nonetheless, uh, Jeremiah Horrocks, uh, as, as Newton says, was the first person, person to propose that not only did the planets move around the sun in ellipses, but the moon revolved around the earth in an ellipse. It's a little bit more complicated than that, I have to say, uh, because not only have you got the moon orbiting around the Earth, you've got the tug of the sun, and the sun actually does attract the moon more strongly than the Earth does, surprisingly, do the calculations. Uh, uh, and so the, 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 the ellipse doesn't quite join up. It, 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 it uh, forms a sort of rosette as the, uh, as the moon works its way around the Earth. So it's not quite like the other planets, it's a little bit more complicated, but the first person to, to come, uh, get along with the basics was, from his own observations, Jeremiah Horrocks. And then he said he detected the long inequality in the motion of Jupiter and Saturn. What is that? Well, uh, again, this is slight deviations from uh, from Kepler's laws. Uh, Kepler didn't spot them himself, but uh, as Jeremiah Horrocks looked at them more closely, he realized uh, that Kepler's second law didn't quite hold when Saturn was close to Jupiter in the sky. Jupiter moved a little bit more slowly or a little bit more quickly. Saturn moved a little bit more quickly or a little bit more slowly. And he realized that it was something to do with the fact that the two were in the same area of the sky. Uh, he didn't know enough about gravity. We hadn't, obviously, uh, Isaac Newton hadn't come along and told us about the theory of gravity, uh, but he realized there was some sort of interaction between Jupiter and Saturn. And he quali quali qualified it. Uh, he put down what the numbers were. He showed that there was something happening, even though he didn't possess either the physics or the mathematics to be able to say what was going on. But that's not bad and good enough indeed to, uh, to be put onto the monument, the monument to Jeremiah. My Horrocks, which is in the, in Westminster Abbey by the by the by the big door going out of the. Uh, it says overlooking Jeremy, uh, uh, Isaac Newton's memorial. It's in quite the, the same way that the White Cliffs of Dover overlook France. Yes, they do, but they're quite a long way away. So it's a uh, he, he's he, he, he has his own monument in Westminster Abbey. That's good enough for me. 
So, uh, in 1639, quite late, he, he, uh, to hear about the mythology of, uh, of much Hull and so on, you'd think he'd been there half his life, but actually he arrived there only a few months before the transit of Venus. And we're not quite sure exactly what he was doing there, but local theory uh, puts him in Carr House. Uh, actually, Bretherton, which is just across the road from much Hull, but they're close enough that you can regard them as just one place. They're about a quarter of a mile or so apart, opposite sides of the, the road from Liverpool into Preston. Uh, and this beautiful house, I mean, it really is lovely. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, we are, we believe that, um, yeah, if you, if you go to the house, there's no doubt about it. Jeremiah Horrocks observed the transit of Venus from Car House, 24th of November, 1639. And uh, it, the history goes that it was this window here, I hope you can see my pointer, on the middle floor, pointing towards the left. And the reason we can be fairly certain that if you did see it from Car House, that was the window, is there, there aren't any other west-facing windows. A Car House is a beautiful looking building, uh, but it's not big. It doesn't go back very far. It's sort of one room wide. It's not quite as impressive as it looks from the front. Uh, and there, uh, in Horrocks' day, there were no windows in the, in the sides of the house. They were all uh, pointing to the south to catch all the sunlight, as it were. Uh, and so the only one with, through which he could have observed was from that master bedroom on the first floor uh, that is the master bedroom still is uh, I mean it, I, up until recently I'm not sure if it still is it was owned by a uh, by somebody who understood Horrocks uh, he was a physics professor at uh, Manchester I think so uh, he, he they made a pretty good job of, uh, of, of keeping Horrocks's memory alive but if you look out the uh, if you look out the window you can you can look to the west which was where uh, the sun was as, uh, when the, the transit of Venus happened uh, so was he a curate at much Hool church the Victorian biographers of, uh, of Jeremiah Horrocks were very keen to say that he was. Uh, however, Alan Chapman has done a lot of research to the, uh, the ecclesiastical records and can find no evidence to that effect. And in any case, Jeremiah Horrocks was still only just into his 20s. And, uh, you know, an actual being a vicar was, was several years off. Being a curate, well, possible, but not that likely. So we suspect probably not, although as we'll see, there's good evidence, I think, that he had some connection to the church. Was he a tutor to the Stones family who lived in Car House? I think that's rather more likely. I think that would be a sensible thing for an educated man to have is to be a school teacher. Uh, the the wealthy uh, 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 the wealthy imply their own uh, uh, their own uh, tutors, uh, and if you were lucky, if you weren't quite so wealthy, well, there were schools that uh, if you paid money, you could go to. So. Uh, it's certainly being a, a tutor to the family it makes a certain amount of sense uh, and uh, I mean it's you would have to say just coming back to this actually was that the, uh, the view out to the west there is there's not a lot of room to observe and I know Kevin Kilburn who's done a lot I also like myself done a lot of research on this published a paper with the owner of the house who's a game, game chap saying that uh, uh, the, entitled the non-observation of the transit of Venus from Car House uh, because it's not at all obvious that you can actually even if you're strained uh, there to actually see the transit of Venus as, as it was on that date from from that window not not convinced but uh, who knows who knows uh, right I'll get on eventually onto this an interesting coincidence I talked earlier about every 1.6 years Venus overtakes Earth on the inside lapses on the inside uh, if you multiply 1.6 by 5 you get to 8 exactly uh, well it's not exactly quite 1.6 but 8 Earth years is 13.004 Venus years that is very close so that's 8 times around the Sun and at 5 extra times uh, 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 so the 8, uh, eight Earth's gone around the sun eight times, Venus gone around the sun eight times and five extra times lapping us on the inside. So that's 13. Uh, and so if you've got a if you've got a transit of Venus, uh, 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 then there might be another one eight years later, because eight years later, Earth has gone around the sun eight times, exactly. Uh, Venus has gone around the sun 13 times, almost exactly. So they're both back at almost exactly the same position. So if they were in line eight years previously, there's a chance that there might be another one eight years later. Uh, if you, uh, you might notice that 8 and 13 are both Fibonacci numbers. If you read the Da Vinci Code's wallop, uh, they make a tremendous amount in the Da Vinci Code about, the, uh, about this 1.6 and, uh, uh, and uh, it, it, the, the five places uh, where Earth, uh, it, it, if you connect up the five places where Earth and Venus are in conjunction, you get a pentacle uh, and, or a, and or a pentagon, which has got five sides and five and eight and 13 are all Fibonacci numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and as I say, it makes a, and at the beginning of the, the Da Vinci Code, he makes a claim that all the, everything in here is true. It's a little bit like Lemuel Gulliver and Gulliver's Travels. It's not 
quite true. He's, uh, he's pushing things. It's not eight and 13 is not exact. Otherwise, you'd have a transit to Venus every eight years. So, and you don't. So uh, uh, if you do, if you do have to read, I've read it for you. So you don't have to. If you do have to read the Da Vinci Code, take it with a little punch of salt. It's not quite true. Kepler knew this, not the Battle of Da Vinci Code, but Kepler knew that if there's a transit, there may be another one eight years later, but he thought that 1639 would be a near miss. Jeremiah Horrocks knew that Kepler's tables were not uh, completely accurate. He did his own calculations as he knew that Venus was gradually growing closer and closer to the sun. Uh, and he resolved the differences between Kepler's tables and his own tables by his own observations. And in late October 1639, this is not very far off, he's only just arrived, only been there a couple of months or so, he realised that there might, only might be, a transit of Venus on Sunday, November the 24th, or possibly the day before, possibly the day afterwards, probably in the late afternoon. And he doesn't have a lot of time. And there's a postal service, and it's about as accurate, about as good as it is these days. If you send the letter, there's a fair chance it'll get to your destination, but it may take some time. He only had time to alert Jonas Horrocks, his brother in Toxteth, William Crabtree, the cloth merchant in Salford, and he asked William Crabtree to pass on, if time allowed, and there wasn't a lot of time, uh, Samuel Foster at Gresham College. Now, I was intrigued. I'd never heard, I, I knew about John Horrocks and I knew about William Crabtree, but Samuel Foster I didn't know a lot about. Uh, and uh, I did some research and came up with some quite extraordinary stuff. It turns out Samuel Foster is from Coventry. Uh, and so one of my other talks talks about Jeremiah Horrocks, Samuel Foster. I call it a detective story because there is a third figure in the story, Nathaniel Nye. And the possibility, and to find out how much of a possibility it is, that he may also have seen the transit of Venus. Uh, but uh, to see all that, you'll have to invite me back to give you another talk on that one. As there's no time to do it this time around. Anyway, certainly two people were warned, possibly Samuel Foster as well. Uh, and so he, he wants to uh, he, he wants to do these. Uh, he, he wants to obviously see whether or not what's happening. So he set up his telescope. Legend has it in the main room above the front door of Car Hall, Much Hall. That may have been his apartment. They may have divided up the room, so that might have been his own room, or possibly the, uh, Mr. Stones, who owned the house, if it was the master bedroom, may have given him permission to make the observations, or possibly was out and uh, Jerry Horrocks just went and observed. I don't know. He projected the sun uh, through a telescope uh, onto a sheet of paper marked with a gradated outline of the solar disk six inches across. So he's projecting the sun, he's not trying to observe or anything stupid like that, he'd burn his eyes out. He's projecting the sun onto a sheet of paper so that he can see what is happening. Uh, to be on the safe side, Jeremiah Hawks observed throughout Saturday, November 23rd, 1639, pity if he missed it by one day in the wrong direction, and he observed that there were some common spots on the sun, uh, by which he wanted to make to, to point out to people that uh, he knew what a sunspot was, and if he did see Venus, that wasn't going to be it. Uh, so he knew they were there on the Saturday, he knew they were there on the Sunday as well. He observed on the Sunday morning from 9am until 10am, and from 11am until after midday, and then... He was called away to greater things, which he was certainly not proper to neglect for these subordinate pursuits. He was playing centre forward for Much Cool United in the Preston Sunday League. No, he wasn't. He was he, a devout Christian from a Puritan faith. St Michael's is a, an Anglican church, but I think uh, it was a broad enough church that uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Horrocks, whatever his theological thoughts were, were, were would have been, would have wanted to contribute. He was a religious man and one did what what what, what he could. Uh, Jeremiah uh, Horrocks, uh, St Michael's is still around. Um, it is now a co-denominational between the Anglicans and the Methodists. Uh, I've been there a couple of times. I actually, uh, just before the Transit of Venus 2004, I went on a, a, a course uh, uh, done by uh, Preston Polly, as it were, University of Central Lancashire, uh, and we went to uh, the Flower Festival at St Michael's Hope Bridge Hall, which was very, very moving. They, they knew that this essential event was going to happen. They were determined to celebrate. They put on the most spectacular display of flowers and so on. It was really rather beautiful. I went back there. Uh, uh, my mum, my late mother, had some friends who lived in Much Hall, uh, and so uh, 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 my uh, 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 my mum and my mum's friend uh, and I were attended the service at uh, at, at, uh, at Much Hall Church. Uh, I, I mean, I, 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 I 
used to take my mum to, to church. I'm not much, much of a church goer, but uh, we were made to feel very welcome. They thought, oh, no, not a Horrocks, another Horrocks nutcase. But nonetheless, they, uh, they, made, they made us very welcome and uh, and very enjoyable time there. So if you ever do want to go, uh, uh, do tell them. Uh, it, it's, it's a lovely church and we'll see some of the, the, the stained glass windows and so in there. It's a, a, a beautiful place, to, a beautiful place to go. And uh, Jeremiah Horrocks thought the same, I'm sure, that he was called away to greater things. He had to attend the service at St. Michael's Church, much sure. Now, can you imagine? He is. He knows there's a possibility of an event that he may uh, he may be the very first person to see. He knows if you're going to see an event like that, uh, you really don't want to observe it from Lancashire in November late in the afternoon uh, do you i mean i'm from lancashire I, i'm not gonna lancashire has many things to recommend it but the weather is not one of them so uh, you know it, it, there are some clouds around and he's done some observing and there have been gaps in the clouds but, but it's it's not great uh, and then he he gets you know it might be it might be nice and clear but he's he he feels it's necessary it's doesn't even feel it's necessary that's what he wants to do is to forsake this opportunity to go and see the transit of venus and instead it's important to him that he goes and sees the uh, it goes and uh, attends the, the the service i i can't help feeling that uh, he probably legged it out pretty quickly <laughs> capital sermon vicar bye and then uh, like a saying bolt across the fields back to car house and brother and back to his telescopes it was cloudy this is Lancashire in November, for goodness sake. However, he said the clouds, as if by design into position, were entirely displaced. And I was once more invited to the grateful task of repeating my observations. I then beheld a most agreeable spectacle. The object of my sanguine wish is a spot of unusual magnitude and a perfectly circular shape, not a sunspot, which had already fully entered upon the sun's disk on the left, so that the limbs of sun and Venus precisely coincided, forming an angle of contact. Not doubting that this really was the shadow of the planet, I immediately applied myself sedulously to observe it. The most agreeable spectacle. Ecce spectaculum gratissimum is how he puts it in, in, in Latin. Uh, but you, know, you can feel it. You can see how much he enjoyed it. I, I've repeated those phrases a couple of times. When, when I saw that the Venus appearing on the sun in rugby in 2004, I imagined Jeremiah Horrocks and William Crabtree looking over my shoulder and saying, most agreeable spectacle. And I, I agreed with them. It was very agreeable. And then and, and two thousand eight years later, 2012, when the clouds, as if by divine, into the position and type were displaced and we saw venus clinging on by its fingertips i said a most agreeable spectacle they the, the rugby people knew what was coming and and, and mocked me for uh, for uh, re repeating jeremiah horrocks yet again but i i don't care it was good enough for jeremiah then it's good enough for me so uh, I, you know, I could have gone to hawaii or uh, iran or somewhere and seen it but i didn't i saw both the transit from england because i'm a lancaster and we 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 put up with the weather up in our part of the world so um, yeah, uh, there are various, uh, various portraits. There's one in Astley Hall, which I haven't seen, but uh, one in the, the Planetarium Liverpool Museum, on one from the Walker Gallery. There's Jeremiah Horrocks in good Puritan garb, very uh, austere black with the, with the, uh, the Pizza Hut hat. Uh, and uh, uh, not an entirely convincing astronomical setup. Um, I think the uh, the uh, he probably put the uh, the six inch thing close rather closer to the telescope, but it's possible. And they've got the general idea. Um, uh, in Much Hall Church, uh, they uh, they have well they have a whole load of stuff there. They you know they 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 have various memorials and so on. But there's the beautiful stained glass window, Jeremiah Horrocks looking at the sun, and you can see the, the little spot on there, uh, and underneath it, Ecce spectac Ecce gratissimum spectacular, the uh, most agreeable spectacle. And then in the Victorian era in the 1870s, they put in a stained glass windows uh, to uh, the the words of our God shall uh, stand forever, uh, uh, religions and science in fellowship in 1874. So you know they, uh, they uh, uh, I think a, a recognition that Jeremiah Horrocks was a good Christian and a good scientist and uh, this is a, a very moving uh, tribute to him and they put another one up for the 2004 transit the heavens declare the glory of God uh, sick Venus transit 1639 to 2004 and again uh, you see and uh, it reminds me uh, outside the uh, the uh, the um, uh, in the the the, the, chap the gate in entry to the church uh, in 2004 there was a hanging basket full of uh, yellow 
bright yellow sunflowers and so on with a single black flower in the middle of it to, to represent Venus. And they, they, they really knew what they were doing with their transit of Venus celebrations back in 2004. So, did anybody else see it? Well, I've kind of given the game away already. Uh, William Crabtree was the only other person to leave an account of seeing the, uh, the Trans of Venus. As far as we know, Jonas uh, in, uh, Horrocks in Tuxedus uh, was clouded out, so uh, uh, he definitely didn't see it. But William Crabtree, it was cloudy in Salford, as it is wont to be, and it stayed cloudy and cloudy and cloudy and cloudy, and then just a few minutes before sunset, uh, William Crabtree actually saw the uh, uh, actually saw the clouds as of by divine intervention parted. And William Crabtree did actually see the uh, uh, the uh, 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 Venus on the disk of the sun. And he tells us he was gobsmacked. He said, "I just stood there and looked at it like a girl." He says, "Not not, not very politically correct." Uh, in fact, there's a you can see there's a, a, a woman watching on. It's uh, Alan Chapman describes as his pre raphaelite wife. Uh, William Crabtree, get, get to guess how old he was, uh, he, he was also in his early 20s so I think they've taken one or two liberties with the uh, uh, with the portrait there uh, and you see uh, the, the draper's cloth the, the, the spilling out of his pocket and so on but he gets the idea of that there he is looking at it and he just he just stood there didn't take any measurements and so on but all he did was in absolute uh, rapt admiration uh, Horrocks's uh, prediction had come true and William Crabtree was a witness to it as I say we only know of two people for certain who saw it I have some evidence and I, I'll say no more than that that uh, perhaps a third person might have seen it uh, 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 Jonas Tox uh, Jonas Crab uh, uh, Jonas Horrocks in, in Toxter definitely didn't see it. Uh, this portrait, if you get the opportunity, is in the um, uh, is in Manchester Town Hall. If you've ever been there in the main in the main hall of Manchester Town Hall, the centre bit where they do the graduations and so on, is a list of series, series of portraits of uh, important events from the history of the city of Manchester. It's uh, it's uh, painted in the 19th century, so it's pre Sir Alex Ferguson and other important things from the history of Manchester. Uh, and some of them are extremely obscure. The arrival of the Flemish weavers, uh, for example. The only thing, the only one that I actually knew uh, was Dalton and the Marsh gases. So uh, you know, it's I mean, it's even pre Peterloo and the really important things from the history of Manchester. Uh, but uh, William Crabtree is on there. It's one of the Ford Mattox Brown's rather lovely murals on the on the on the walls of uh, Manchester Town Hall. If you watched the uh, Steve Cougar movie, The Parole Officer, uh, a rather peculiar comedy drama, it, the end of it takes place in Manchester Town Hall and there's a chase. And from time to time, William Crabtree keeps trop cropping up in the background. Uh, the movie has no other, no, nothing much more to be said for it other than, but if you, if you stick all the way to the end, you might spot William Crabtree in the background. So. Uh, okay, so the next year or so, William uh, that uh, Jeremiah Horrocks had seen this, and he spent the next twelve months writing up his account of what he'd seen, and he called it Venus on the Sun, or the Latin for it, Venus in Sole Visa. The whole of 1640 doing it, uh, and he's uh, he's careful, he, having made observations of where, where Venus was on the Sun. He wanted to establish that first of all, he genuinely had seen Venus. It wasn't the sunspot, so he made measurements. So he only had 40 minutes before the sun went down, uh, but he took them at 15-minute uh, intervals so he could show that the disk was moving across the sun, unlike the sunspots, which more largely remained in place. Uh, uh, he could see that, uh, it, that the, the shadow was dark, so Venus did not shine by its own light. It, it may look bright. Uh, we saw it earlier this year, the, the great lockdown conjunction. It was extremely bright, wasn't it? Uh, but uh, it, And incidentally, that was eight years on from 2012 this year. So Venus got very close to the sun uh, and actually went through, if you had the, the right equipment, you could see it going through the, 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 uh, the outer corona of the sun. Uh, uh, so the near, that was a near miss uh, the, uh, earlier this year. But uh, Venus itself uh, uh, only shone that incredible brightness of Venus in the, in the night sky prior to the conjunction in, uh, uh, back in uh, May this year was, uh, was only re by reflected sunlight off those uh, uh, phosgene filled uh, clouds in the, in the Venusian atmosphere. Uh, Venus is a lot smaller than expected. Uh, I mean, had he taken Gassendi a little bit more seriously, he might have realised that Mercury was tiny, uh, but uh, I think there was, a, there was a lot of uh, dubiousness that uh, that uh, Venus was, uh, 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 that the Mercury really was that small. They were expecting Venus to be maybe a quarter of the size of the Sun, so when it came up as a definitely, you know, sort of one twelfth the size of it, I, no, 
a lot less than that, you know, much smaller, uh, much smaller in size. That was a surprise, but he reported what he saw, uh, and so he made this, made, he made some calculations. Uh, he did he he made the assumption that all the planets, um, sorry, that the the size of the planets is proportional to their distance from the sun. He knew that Mercury was a lot smaller than Mer Venus because it's a lot less bright. Uh, he knew that Mars was probably a bit smaller than than, Ver uh, than the, the Venus, so Mars didn't really fit in. But he also knew that Jupiter, a long way away, was quite large in size. So making some, some sort of assumption that perhaps the planets got bigger as you got further from the sun, you can then do calculations. And if you do that, uh, he figured out that the distance from the Earth to the sun was about 60 million miles. If he'd actually made a different assumption that all the planets are the same size, then he'd have come up with about 90 million miles, which would have been correct, uh, but only because Venus and the Earth are actually the same size. He's, he's making some assumptions, you know, he's, uh, they're not unreasonable that uh, perhaps they, uh, they, they, the planets get bigger as you go out from the sun, it's, but it's, it's much larger. Kepler thought about 10 million miles, but uh, Horrocks had the beginnings of information to be able to guess as to the size of the solar system. Most importantly, and he's at much He's, he's very, it takes great uh, uh, care to, uh, to make sure of this, that the reason that he saw the transit of Venus was because of the results of his careful calculations. Other people didn't see it because they didn't know to look. They could have done the same calculations he did and came up with the same prize that Jeremiah Horrocks did about Venus, but it was only seen on the sun because Jeremiah Horrocks did the observations, realized that Kepler's laws, Kepler's uh, tables were slightly wrong, corrected them and realized there was a the chance that the transit was going to happen. And he is it's very keen to, to push this idea and why shouldn't he be? I mean, he, he grasped this prize against all the odds. You know, all it needed was a little bit more cloud and he would have missed the, the, the beginning of the transit of Venus, uh, which was only visible for you know, 40 or 50 or so minutes on a cloudy November afternoon in, in, in Lancashire. So there are one or two contemporary editions of Venus in, uh, in Solar Visa still around, uh, and uh, Alan Chapman actually managed to secure uh, two, uh, three of them for Cambridge University Library, and I went and looked at them in, in, in the University Library. This is one of them. It may be in Horrocks' own hand. It might be Flamsteed's written written copy of it uh, so you know it's a, it's an original handwritten copy not necessarily by by jeremiah horrocks but uh, you know it, it it could be and you see up at the top he, he looked at it on the on the 23rd he's third on the 24th uh the bit is about six or seven lines down ad maior avocado i was called away to greater things and then the uh, the lesser pursuit is actually in greek rather than in uh, in 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 latin i don't i i did latin o level but uh, uh, i don't know that much but uh, greek was, is all Greek to me, as they say. Uh, and then down here, uh, Eke Grecitimum Spectaculum, down at the about three quarters of the way down. That I most agreeable spectacle. I love it when he says that. It's just that is an astronomer who's seeing something for the first time. Just wonderful thing. Uh, so he had a chance to write up his accounts. He discussed with various letters with William Crabtree in, in Salford about what he was going to do. Uh, and they talked about meeting at the beginning of 1641. But he also talks about not being very well. Uh, and the letters suddenly dry up. They were going to meet on the uh, uh, in early January, but he died January the 3rd, 1641. Causes not known to us, other than the fact he'd indicate he wasn't in the best of health. Uh, uh, Crabtree was you know, inconsolable. I've lost, alas, my dear Horrocks, hink illi lacrimi, so tears fall, irreparable loss. How true. William Crabtree, saying, not much older than, uh, only a year or so older than Jeremiah Horrocks. So he's he's only 23 years of age, Jeremiah Horrocks. William Crabtree is in, 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 uh, only in his in mid-twenties, and he only lasts another three years later. He actually died in the Battle of Marston Moor, I think. You know, if the uh, if the if the plague doesn't get you, then the round the roundheads would. It's uh, it, it, these were <laughs> life could be short in those. Some people made it through to their three score years and ten. Many more didn't. They had to make the most of the time. That you 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 had on this earth because uh, civil upheavals or or uh, uh, incurable uh, in pandemics and uh, what well, we know about them uh, uh, it could uh, could could stop things very quickly. Horrocks's papers it was not by no means considered that it, we might have never known anything about him other than the uh, the uh, uh, very uh, uh, worthy attempts by various people to secure his papers. Uh, Jonas Horrocks took some of them with him to Ireland 
but fortunately returned to England. And John Wallace, his friend from Emmanuel, and John Worthington, his friend from Emmanuel, and later from Manchester, were able to recover the papers. And some more ended up with Christopher Townley of Burnley, from a great Catholic family in Townley, who uh, uh, who's an antiquarian and collected these sorts of things. And his protege, Jeremiah Shackley, uh, I, I'll mention a little bit shortly more. So there were men of uh, men of good learning in Lancashire and in Yorkshire at this time who were knew of the importance of Jeremiah Horrocks's work. And again, as I say in one of my other talks, it was actually another 20 or so years after he died before Venus in Sole Visa was actually published. Uh, and that was a result of Havelius in, in Poland getting a, uh, getting a copy of, uh, of uh, Venus in Sole Visa and appending it to his own observations of a transit of Mercury. He said, well, here's the transit of Mercury I saw, but you should know about this transit of Venus that was seen by Jeremiah Horrocks. And that was actually the first time that it appeared in print. So by no means certain that we would have actually, you know, it, we have to rely on the goodwill of, of many good people, Wallace Worthington, Jonas Horrocks, Stanley Shackley, I think it was uh, Christian Huygens in London and uh, and uh, and uh, Hevelius in, in Poland uh, to actually secure these works. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this, the, uh, it, a point I've been making is uh, there are two themes to me that uh, that occur from here is uh, is first of all the birth of English astronomy, uh, uh, English observational astronomy might be reasonably uh, uh, reasonably. Um, um, uh, um, uh, it's said to have started in, uh, in, 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 with Jeremiah Horrocks as the first major discovery, but also, of course, uh, William Crabtree and Salford, also in observational astronomy, and the great William Gascoigne, uh, uh, whose legacy, the, the invention of the micrometer, was arguably as important as any of the observations made by, by, by any of them. Uh, Jeremiah Shackley in Burnley uh, would actually, he was so impressed by Jeremiah Horrocks that he set off to India to see the, uh, the, the transit of Mercury there. Uh, in Seymour talks about about this in a recent edition of Astronomy Now. We know that he got to, to India, we know he saw the transit of Mercury, and we don't know very much about him after that. He, uh, he disappeared into India, presumably, I suspect, didn't last too much longer. But Christopher Townley, then the antiquarian, uh, and John Worthington in Manchester. You know, this was a circle of people doing world-class astronomy, which nobody else, coming at the transit of Venus, that no, absolutely nobody else was, uh, was, uh, was doing anywhere else in the world. And people like Gassendi, perfectly well qualified, Gassendi could have seen the transit of Venus had he done the calculations that Jeremiah Horrocks saw. So, uh, you know, it's a, a, a due credit. Uh, the north of England was an essential part of, 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 of world-class astronomy at this time. Uh, I would say, again, my research into Samuel Foster suggested that there was also a group of astronomers in the Midlands we're also doing very, very good astronomy, perhaps not quite at the heights of Horrocks and Gascoigne, but uh, uh, again, uh, perhaps you, you might invite me back someday to, to, to tell you about Samuel Foster and his friends. Um, and uh, the, the, so Horrocks' legacy, you know, he's, he wasn't just the guy who saw the transit of Venus, he provided so, uh, many of the important things that Isaac Newton picked up on, the motion of the moon, the interaction of Venus, uh, of uh, Jupiter and Saturn, that form part of Isaac Newton's thinking uh, 40, 40, 50 years later, uh, 30 years later, he did the thinking and 20 years later before that he published in the Principia Mathematica. So uh, uh, Isaac Newton certainly acknowledges Jeremiah Horrocks. And then Edmund Halley, who realized that transits could be used to size the solar system. The, uh, um, uh, the, uh, he realized that if you observe transits from widely separated locations, then you could, uh, uh, you'd, you'd see Venus crossing the sun at slightly different positions. Uh, you then do a balls achingly difficult calculation to, uh, to reduce the numbers. But if you do accurate timings from different locations around the world, you can get an accurate value for the size of the solar system. So 122 years on, for in, the, in the transit 1761, 1769, accurate recording of transits were a tool for measuring the size of the solar system. And as we know, expeditions sent around the world, Captain Cook, we, it's, it's well known. Mason and Dixon, I do a talk about them and, uh, and their trips to see the, the transit of Venus and then to, 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 to draw the line across America. Uh, Neville Maskelyne as well, it, it went to the South Atlantic to observe the, the transit of Venus. And the, the other theme that I come, come back from, well, North Country uh, astronomers, the Cambridge connection, uh, but also the connection to New England. And I, I do a talk about Jeremiah Horrocks and New England is that in this American colonies, the time between transits of Venus, 122 years, is enough for fledgling colonies to have established themselves for religious freedom, political independence on their way to maturity and independence from, from the home country. To the extent that in 1769 in Rhode Island, where which was 
virgin territory uh, virtually when in 1631 the settlement had only just started in 1639 by 1769 a, a street near the hill where the 1769 transit was observed still named transit street and uh, my relatives in Rhode Island when they took a picture for me I've driven along transit street they had no idea why it was called transit street but it is called transit street because the uh, because of the transit of Venus so you know uh, Jeremiah Horrocks had connections into these places uh, of uh, and you know he 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 corresponded with people in uh, in the in the New England colonies. So, uh, I, as I say, the, the three things I would take away from about the story of this curious astronomer was he was a North Country astronomer. He was a Lancastrian and proud of it, as far as I know. And he interacted with other astronomers across the north of England. He connected with the new colonies in in North America for reasons of uh, Emmanuel being a, uh, a, 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 a Puritan college and with all these connections here and certainly did astronomy with those and I, I talk about those elsewhere but he was also from K Emmanuel College in Cambridge and the university there um, we celebrated on, on Transit Day in 2004, uh, we celebrated in Emmanuel. We spent some time observing the transit of Venus from the Institute of Astronomy. And then after the, the crowds had all gone, after the transit had finished, we did a series of lectures. Um, there was a chap, a visiting professor from America. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I, I, it took me a while to convince them that they should do something to celebrate the transit of Venus. But uh, when uh, I forget it was Roger, somebody other wrote in from America saying, "What you doing about the transit of Venus?" They realised that they ought to do something, and so they put on a series of talks, of, of which this is actually one of them. Uh, also in the audience, and if you, if you can see me on camera, a chap called Peter Orton. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, uh, Jeremiah Horrocks, uh, Peter Orton has written a series of excellent biographies. And this particular one, The Brief Brilliant Life of Jeremiah Horrocks, the Father of British Astronomy. And in case you're not certain what it was he, he did, they've also put in big red letters on the cover, The Transit of Venus, as the most important thing that he saw. He signed my copy on Transit Day in uh, Pierce Wishes from Peter Orton, 8th of June 2004. He was also in the audience that day. We invited him along to, uh, to, uh, to see the transit of Venus. It's a very good, there are a couple of places where I think he gets it slightly wrong, but that's true of, of many biographies and so on. And I'm not really knocking him for it. It's a very well-written read. And if you want to know more about Jeremiah Horrocks' story, it's certainly worth reading. So I think I will conclude at that point. I'm probably coming up on my, uh, on my time. So uh, more references if you want to know about them. And thank you for listening to me. Mike, thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, cancel your spotlight. Yep. And if you can stop uh, sharing your screen. Okay. Stop share. And uh, now you're back to. Yep. Okay. okay. And uh, what a splendid talk. Uh, going back to uh, transits of Venus and Halley, uh, I don't know whether you know, but um, Swinton has a. Uh, connection with transits of Venus through Charles Green, who was the astronomer on uh, Captain Cook's voyage to oh, Tahiti. Yes. Okay. And, uh, so uh, he was born in the uh, in our local area. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, I, uh, didn't, I didn't I didn't know that. I know I knew I knew Green. Uh, I visited the Sydney Observatory, obviously, where they have uh, yep. they're very proud of Captain Cook. And, uh, and you know, they they uh, they uh, they're very they, there's a lot on the uh, on the, the Cook Transit expedition there. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So we, it, yeah. it's it's the Yorkshire Swinton, not the Lancashire Swinton that he comes from. We we'll just put that out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, as usual, um, questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question, will you put a digital hand up? If you can't do that, will you wave at me and I will try and spot you. So, have we got a question? Phil, Phil Muffet, can you unmute yourself please, Phil? As usual, I've got one. Can you Go on me? then. Yeah, yeah. Do we know what telescope he used, i.e. what make, well, I'm assuming it was a refractor, but do we know the make of it and was it like a three inch? Do we know that? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I, yes, I think I have. it was a definitely a refractor and it wasn't very big. Now, somebody said that they bought a, a telescope at the Cambridge Fair, but I'm not sure if that was Isaac Newton or, or, or Jeremiah Horrocks. Yeah, it's that sort of thing. I think they were 
ones around uh, you know the, 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 a lot of these things you could get if you really wanted one so i don't i don't think it was i don't i don't know who made it uh, but i think there were one or two telescopes around i mean they, they get used for things other than astronomy obviously they're quite yeah. useful to have a spyglass so i don't i don't think it was anything you know very high quality and it definitely wasn't a reflecting telescope because of course it was isaac newton who came up with those so uh, I, I i can't tell you the maker but it, it, it was a refracting telescope and and small Mike, yeah, um, yeah. It might, might be the two inch, perhaps. Yeah, that's that, that sort of yeah, not, nothing special. But you, you don't need it, of course. No, no. So, yeah. so it's not a, a particularly big telescope on a uh, equatorial mount to be able to do these kinds of observations. Yeah, no, uh, def definitely not. I think uh, I, I think the uh, you know the sort of pillar and claw type uh, uh, mount is probably all that was needed for that sort of thing. Marvelous stuff. Okay. Has anybody else got a question? I'm looking around. Oh, uh, Jan. Jan Stallard, can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, I haven't got a question. I just want to say to you that as a Scouser, we do have a Horrocks Avenue. Excellent. All the right, do downside you... is it's not in Toxteth, it's in Garston. <laughs> do you know if it's the same Horrocks? Um, it's spelt C K S. Yeah, I, I mean, so I they are they, they are a well-known Lancastrian family. Uh, of course, they had Jane Horrocks on. Um, who on, who do you think you are? And she's a Lancastrian Horrocks. Uh, so they traced her quite a long way back, but not as far as Jeremiah, because Jeremiah had no children. So she's definitely not a, a lineal descendant of him. But I suspect there's the, you know there's, there are Horrocks. It's, it's quite a common surname in that yeah. part of the world, uh, and that may well be because they're all related. You know? So uh, uh, it, it, let's let's take it as a as a passing uh, <laughs> passing uh, passing recognition of him. Thank you, John. And questions. And I'm, I can't. Oh, yeah. Les. Yes. Um, we've you've used some in your talk tonight, which were fantastic, Mike. Thank you. Uh, we've there's pictures by the dozen of everybody else in astronomy, but not one of Jeremiah. I wonder why. Yeah, I, I mean, we don't know what he looked like. You know, there are only uh, there are only uh, representations of what he might have looked like. Uh, he, he died too young. You know, that's a <laughs> unlike rock stars, uh, astronomers, they die too young. We don't know we, we don't know what they look like. So uh, it's a pity, really, isn't it? That uh, you know, uh, yeah. But there's a um, uh, you know there's a a, a a Liverpool sculptor called Phil Garrett uh, who has built a semi-scale model of Jeremiah Horrocks and he's hoping to get funding to actually build a full-scale a full-scale bronze statue of Jeremiah Horrocks to put somewhere prominent in Liverpool to to uh, to, um, uh, to to commemorate well very, very famous Scouser so uh, you know I, I hope the funding for it hadn't gone very well when I, I made a small contribution but the funding for it hadn't gone very well when I last looked uh, and uh, I, <laughs> there are other things to, to donate money to at the moment so I, I mean I hope it goes through it's a, he's a very good sculptor. But that's interesting in that we don't know what it looks like so will they use your face for the statue? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, don't, I, I think uh, there is a picture there. He looks. I'm, I'm a bit. I'm a bit too old for it, unfortunately. That uh, it, it's. It. It does. It, it, Phil Garrett's statue actually uh, conveys the fact, which you know, uh, uh, other people have not done. That he was young. You know, he was only in his teens and then his early twenties. And you know, the, the the one in Manchester Town Hall of William Crabtree puts him fifty years older than uh, than he the, the, than he actually was because you know, where, uh, wisdom and uh, wisdom was associated with age in the in the in the language of the art where actually they were young men doing the astronomy and uh, you know, and get, uh, phil, phil garrett actually did, does that one if you google phil garrett, garrett astronomy you'll get, get, get a picture of it we've uh, we have alan quite on a regular basis seen as our president to give us talks uh, and he did jeremy at, at oryx and uh, this kind of thing and uh, his wife rachel said she was going to have a go at his his bust at least uh, in joints uh, but it forgot to bring it with him oh. um, so 
Yeah. We haven't heard any more of that since, and this, this is a lot of years ago. Uh, yeah. So I'm hoping that she might still have it and could contribute to that statue, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, well, I know Jar I know uh, um, Alan Chapman. Uh, they did a launch party for it, which I was unable to get to. But uh, Alan Chapman uh, spoke you know, on Phil Garrett's behalf at that one, as did Jerry Gilligan from the, the Society of the History of Astronomy. So uh, you know, he's got a lot. He's got a lot of goodwill behind him. Yeah. Uh, whether or not that translates to funding, I'm not sure. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Okay, okay lad ladies and gents, one last uh, plea for a. Uh, Question? No, can't. Can I tell it. you about the Mr. Pa Mr. Potato Head? If uh, nobody oh, else is oh, asking. Go on. I, I did make a note about Mr. Yeah. Potato Head. I, didn't, yeah. I forgot about it. This, this is this is um, the politics of twinning. Uh, um, Retford in North, in who is where William Blackstone came from, is twinned with Portucket in Rhode Island, which I, I know quite well because some of my relatives are there, and uh, so. Um, uh, so they wanted to commemorate the famous guy from Retford who went over and founded the, the, the Rhode Island colony. And uh, and so uh, the, what they make in Portucket, uh, it used to be a mill town. Uh, uh, my relatives actually emigrated there because they went from the Lancashire mills to the Rhode Island mills when there, when there was a downturn in the, 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 the thing there. But uh, these days, the main thing was the, is the Mr. Potato Head factory. So the people of Portucket as a present to the people of Retford gave a six foot high statue of William Blackstone as a Mr. Potato Head, which is great, but what do you do with it? You know, and in Retford, it sat, sat there in the, on the town hall steps for about a month, and then they shifted it to the recycling bins around the back of Sainsbury's. Uh, and when the people back in Portucket, uh, when the people back in Portucket found out about this, they weren't right pleased. You know? <laughs> What are you doing with our beautiful fiberglass statue of William Blackstone as Mr. Potato Head? But on the other hand, you know, what do you do with the six foot high Mr. Potato Head statue of William Blackstone? You can't, you can't put it on display forever. So I think the moral of the whole story is uh, be careful do with what you do with the present, but be careful what presents you give as well. Give. Yeah. Right. Okay, ladies and gents, uh, I don't see anybody else wanting to ask a question. So can we finish uh, with our usual Mike Springs Winter Astronomical Society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, for an excellent talk.